instead of being like, oh my gosh, he torches people. Ooh -woo. Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today I will be doing my book review for A Cura Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. On screen you get to watch me paint this rainbow silhouette of a city reflective of the rainbow in Valeris. And later on you'll see me make some resin heart inspired by the High Lords. And I'll link the artist who I got the pictures I put in the hearts for in the description box below. If you don't want to listen to my voice, or if you haven't read the series yet and don't want to get spoiled, feel free to sit in the video and just place music over the painting. For those of you who don't know, Akatar starts off as a loosely based Beauty and the Beast retelling, where a human girl named Fira accidentally kills a fae, and because of this treaty sets in place, her punishment is that she has to go with Tamlin, the High Lord of Spring, to his court, and stuff happens from there. I feel like this is either a series you love or you hate. Personally, I really enjoyed it when I read it, but I can acknowledge that it has its issues. My quick overall non spoiler thoughts. I did not like Akatar, I give it 1.5 stars. I didn't really care about the plot of Aquamath, but I really like Beast and the Inner Circle and just the banter. And Echo War is my favorite in the series, as we actually got to see Fira show off her skills, the world starts expanding, and we were able to see more of the characters. And I thought Aquafast was really unnecessary, but had banter, which was the main thing I liked in the series. Fun fact, this was my favorite series at just one point. When I read Aquamath and Aquamore in the span of two days, then spent the next week just rereading the series a million times during summer break. My hype has died down since then, though I still enjoy occasionally rereading some of my favorite scenes, and it's a nice series. That being said, I can acknowledge that there are problematic aspects. I'll go over some of them in this review. Honestly, half of them I didn't notice until I started binge-watching rant reviews and I was like, oh gosh, this is terrible. But the ones I did notice while reading myself and that did bother me, I'll go into more during my review. So yeah, I'm just going to go straight into the spoiler section now because I feel like this is a pretty popular series and by now, either you've read the series, don't plan on reading the series, or will take forever to read the series. So, yeah. Let's start off with Avatar and why I hated it. The main reason why I could not get into Avatar was because I felt like it just dragged on and on, talking about their relationship. I do think that it is possible I might have been more invested if I didn't know ahead of time about what happened to Tamlin's character in Aquamath. But since I read it after already hearing some people's thoughts on it, the whole time it just felt like the development of a relationship that was bound to fail anyways. That pre-existing notion of Tamlin and Reese was also the reason why I became so much more invested the moment Reese entered the page, which was halfway through the books anyways, and I don't know if it was objectively good, I just really enjoyed the tension and the roast in the scene where Reese comes to Tamlin gives me life. The next reason I didn't like Avatar was because the main plot point does not make any sense. Like, Fira kills one of Tamlin's sentry and literally skins him. And her punishment is to go from a poor house to a high lord's mansion. She has her family provided for and she gets to live a life in luxury. Oh, how awful! It must be so hard living rich. Yes, that punishment would definitely deter a crime. What is the government doing with actual prison systems? The whole scene with Under the Mountain also felt extremely underwhelming to me. The trial fear that it goes through should have been really scary and dangerous, and normally I feel like Sarah J Mass is usually pretty good at writing these dramatic scenes, but they just all felt really flat and I did not really care. Like, oh my gosh, she has to pull a lever, which one will she pull? Also, if Amarantha was so manipulative in the way that she says that if Fira completes these three tasks then she'll free Tamlin but not right away, then why did she set up the riddle to release them immediately anyways? Also. The answer to the riddle was love. Really? How does that fit into Amaranta's character at all? Their romance also has multiple problematic aspects, and despite what happened in book 2 with Tailman being a more extreme version of that, I do not believe it was intentional, and if it was, it was not done well. I would have understood romanticizing Tailman's abusive action because 
when you're in a toxic relationship, that's what you try to do. However, if that was the intention, I felt like it was very poorly done in Akatari because it was romanticized to the point where it barely hinted at the fact that the relationship was toxic unless you think extra critically. For example, after that non-consensual kiss scene, I felt like it would have been better if Feyre had more resistance. Like if she said she forgave him but still felt a lingering wrongness about the whole experience. Or at least do something hinting to the wars the fact that she didn't totally agree with what was going on. Instead of, you know, genuinely forgiving him and moving on like it was no big deal. Reese is another character I eventually found love with. But if he was meant to be the healthy relationship Fear moves on to, then all the fucked up stuff he does in Agatar was so unnecessary. One of the scenes that really bothered me was how he twisted her broken arm to get her to agree to a bargain. Swoon, right? Not only was it extremely messed up and like not romantic, but it was also really unnecessary. Like, why couldn't he just talk to her about how she may get an infection and have Feyre agree to it right then and then? Also, bringing her as his consort and making her dance and drugging her and painting on her and whatever was really wrong. Like, I get that it was too angry with Tamlin, but it was still pretty messed up. Later on, it's revealed that he dropped her so that she wouldn't remember it for the horrors she has to witness. Swoon, am I right? But I felt like it was still over the top and unnecessary. Then he's portrayed as this great person because he doesn't touch her beyond her waist and hands and how he could have raped her but didn't. That bar is very low. I get that it was trying to show what he's willing to do for his people, but at the very least, I felt like Vader forgave him way too easily. Most of my issues with Reese was gone by Akamav, but his sudden character shift was very ridiculous, so I'm just going to pretend Agatha never happened. Moving on to A Court of Mist and Fury. I guess I will start off by continuing my talk about Reese. I feel like A Court of Mist and Fury portrays Reese as his morally perfect character, but like, he's literally not. Don't get me wrong, I eventually fell in love with him, but I do see him as a very complex character. Akamath goes a lot into what we sacrificed and endured to protect his friends and people, but I felt like the fact that he was willing to become a monster to protect them was totally brushed off. Like, yes, he had good intent while doing it and you understand his passion for his friends, but he still did mess up things, like, you know, little things like killing and torturing people, and I feel like it could have added so much complexity to his character if Fira went more onto that instead of just focusing on what he had to enjoy and talk about the things that he had to do. I'm not saying he's an evil character, but I felt like I could have dug deeper into the depth of this character. Instead of being like, oh my gosh, he tortures people, ooh -woo. That being said, the version of me that read this book initially did fall in love with him and I'm not even sorry about that. Like, I get it's a pretty common trope, but I still love how self-sacrificing and selfless he is, how badass and powerful he is, and just how much he cares about his people was really nice to see. Also, his flirting, despite being just slightly sexual at the time, was golden and amazing comic relief. I also adored Feyre and Reese's relationship. I get that it objectively has its issues, but I still subjectively enjoyed it. I really like seeing Feyre's character development, how they work together to fight Highburn, and watching them go on these missions like retrieving the ring from the Weaver and stealing the book from Tarquin, which, side note, was such a good scene because Feyre is able to start showing her badass size and getting close to him to know where it is, but Tarquin was also such a good person and I would have loved to see more of him. Also, another side rare, I get that Feyre lived for a long time and that 50 years of leadership is not long to them, but you know what? Everyone respects Feyre just fine after she's been there for a year, so if Tarquin isn't respected, that's his problem. Then again, I guess it's kind of hard to earn respect when you're helplessly trapped under Amaranda. Anyways, I also appreciate how honest Feyre and Reese's relationship was, in that it wasn't like things were suddenly perfect between them, but he's also really supportive of her and helped her tackle the quote-unquote darkness put in her, but it wasn't like he just appeared and all the problems was naturally solved, and she still had to work through them herself. The main reason I love the series though, was the inner circle. I loved how each member has a really distinct personality, and their friendship was really wholesome and made me laugh so many times. Honestly, I'm pretty sure this would have been a 3 star read if it wasn't for them, 
but I just had so much fun reading and reading the adventure and casual roles. And they were also such a supportive and caring group of friends. Just a side note about books in general, I personally love side characters so much. I love seeing how different personality and relationship dynamics, and even how different characters relate to each other because of their history and what motivates their actions in a book. I think that those dynamics could add a lot to a story, which is why I like more complex stories that follow or at least for to see a huge cast of characters. And I love seeing how different backstory and perspectives can expand our view of the story and the world. In addition, I feel like side characters are super interesting and in that you don't always know their motivations or everything about them until the story starts expanding into the history. What if that's through their action or overly long monologues that somehow make me fall in love with them? Anyways, back to the inner circle. Asriel was my personal favorite character besides favorite in Leaf. I related so much to his introvertness, but his occasional confidence and snarkiness was just golden. I also loved how dark and mysterious quote unquote he is, but also how he has that kind and caring side. And I thought that it was interesting how Reese described that love as icy wish that couldn't be dulled. Also, I don't care about that stupid mini bomb that came out of absolutely nowhere. Ezreal and Elaine are my OTP and you can't convince me otherwise. I also really like Cat Scene because he was a very obnoxious and fun character, while also being this like warrior or whatnot. I do think his romance with Nesta was kind of overly angsty, but I do think it offers a really interesting contrast from the romance between Feyre and Reese, and even the more romantic tension with Asriel and Elaine, which, again, you can't tell me doesn't exist. Also, I love the inner circle as a whole, but the friendship between Cassie and Asriel and Reese is still one of my favorite friend groups to read about. Moa was okay. She was a fun character, but I didn't really fall in love with her. One of the things about her that I did find interesting was the dynamic between her and her family in the Court of Nightmares. I'm not really sure how I feel about her coming out as a lesbian. On one hand, yay representation! But at the same time, I felt like it just was just kind of there and nothing really happened with it. Also, I understand how it would be hard for her to come out, especially considering the amazing people that she gets to call family and what happened after she got betrothed to Eris. But at the same time, I feel like tagging someone along who is your friend for 500 years is just a bit excessive. Like, I feel like she could have said that she wasn't interested in him or something. I don't know. Last up is Amrin. And I loved Amrin so much. I love how she's so cynical and cold, but also so sassy and badass. Some of my favorite scenes with her was when she complained about how pathetic everyone is. When the book was whispering these pretty things to her favorite and she just tells her to shut up. All the times when she complains about the inner circle taking up space in my home, when she says, quote, the quickest way to a man's heart is the fourth and fifth rib, or when she's just ranting about how she has the right to be grumpy out of saving all their lives in Aquafest. Because, honestly, true. I also really like the scene when Feyre was really afraid to go to the bone carpet because she's afraid of not being able to get out of the mountain, and Amrin gives his necklace saying that it would keep her safe even though it was just a random necklace to give her confidence. I will say though that I could not care less about her romance with Varian. Some of my favorite comic relief scenes involving the inner circle includes when they first met, and you can tell what the conversations would be like when literally the first thing Cassian says to Feyre is like, come on Feyre, we don't buy, unless you ask us to. Great first impression. Also the entire first conversation when they had dinner together was just great, and we were really able to see how their different personalities stood out against each other. Not with the inner circle, but about the inner circle. When Reese and Feyre were going to the Weaver's place, and there was this obvious romantic tension between them, but then Reese has the guts to taunt her, and it's not like if you needed to move on in a physical sense, I'm sure Cassia would be more than happy to oblige. Like, shut up. Speaking of Cassian, the scene after Feyre and Reese got their meeting bond, and Reese talks about how he's in this haze of just him being overly protective of her, and then he comes back and Cassian is like, Fira doesn't look too tired. Maybe she could give me a ride. And he's attacked him. I know it was just to take the edge off him, but I feel like even if he didn't need to, that's exactly the kind of petty thing Cassian would say. Also, I loved all the casual insults and rows. Like when Lisa's like, trust me, there's no party. Only a massacre if Cassian doesn't shut his mouth. 
or when Cassie is trying to train Fira and Emlyn is all like, Here you the first time you said it. So yeah, moving on, a couple other things that stood out to me is that Sarah J. Mass has this very dramatic writing style. And it was something that really lends itself to create these powerful scenes sometimes and make me roll my eyes out of times. Like the whole and my men, the males, like literally no one cares. Or that constant like it's your choice or how it's never Azriel's hands but Azriel's scarred hands. Okay, but we get it. He had a hard life. At the same time though, I feel like ooh, the really dramatic writings makes the battle or even the rope scene so much more epic and impactful so I didn't totally hate it. Another little thing about Reese, his whole evil dictator act was interesting. Like, I get that he wants to portray himself as a threat to prevent others from stepping out of line, but like, 500 years of pretending to be evil, and it never once occurred to him that maybe being nice and friendly it will be good for making alliances. Wow, mind blown. Because it works out just fine at the High Lord meeting. You're telling me that Reese is a mastermind, but he could have put two and two together and think that, hey, maybe being nice isn't a horrible way to conduct foreign affairs and form positive alliances? Just saying. But then again, I guess pretending to be evil literally meant that he could protect Flares from Amaranda. Also, can you say that literally maybe half your court the court of dreams and the other half the court of nightmares and being an open and caring leader to half and pretending to be an evil dictator to the other half is not good leadership? Like, yeah, that won't lead to division at all. I get that it was because of the whole thing with them not expecting him because he was half Illyrian and they're sexist assholes who degrade females. And I'm glad that he doesn't compromise his morals. But really, don't blame them for hating you. Discussions are a thing. And even if the court of nightmares isn't his real home, they are still the high court citizen and he should be a good leader to them instead of treating them like sacrificial lambs for his real people. Now, moving on to my favorite book in the series, a Court of Wings and Ruin. I love the beginning of this book. Just seeing how much Fira has grown and how badass and manipulative she has become was so fun to watch. I get that not all her actions were morally correct, and while it ends up backfiring later on, it was entertaining. The way she gets involved with the Hydeman twins, the way she knows that Tamara is obsessed with his pride, so she makes and he steal the keys and blame the guards and act like she's the one who will listen to them while Tamlin doesn't care for centuries even if they would literally die for him. That is some golden divide and conquer. Also, the scene where Ianthi talks about the sun rising and she just bends light so it falls on her was so satisfying to read. I will say though that I could have lived without her trying to seduce Lucian. I get the strategic benefit of it, but at the same time, Seducing someone who was your friend just to make your ex jealous to tear apart their personal relationship for political purposes is kind of a shitty thing to do. But at the same time, Tamlin wasn't really a good friend to begin with, so like... I also felt like the dynamic between Feyre and Tamlin after she manipulated and left him at the beginning of Aquilor had a lot of potential to be, de to be developed well, but it just kind of fell short. A lot. I felt a little bad for Tamlin in the beginning because you can tell that he's remorseful and really wants things to get better between him and Feyre and the whole time Feyre is just like, haha, <laughs> too late. But at the same time, Tamlin was literally such a narcissist, like his girlfriend ditches him and he's convinced that the only way something like that could happen is if another guy literally went into her mind and trusted her thoughts against him. Like, maybe, crazy thought? Have you considered the fact that you were just a possessive asshole who locked her in her house even though you know she's dealing with PTSD, huh? And like, he acts like she's obligated to forgive him even though that's her choice. Am I becoming Reese? Later on, I really like the scene where Phaedra and Azriel goes to Highwind's camp thing to get Elaine back, mainly because I love the intensity of the battle and Elaine and Azriel are my OTP, but also the way they were in danger and Tamlin ends up saving them was really cool to see. I feel like that scene says a lot about his character, but I wish they were able to have an actual conversation about it later because they just kind of went from throwing insults at each other to publicly humiliate the other person at a meeting to him telling her to be happy and save Reese, which is another scene that says a lot about how much he genuinely loves her despite his really not loving actions before. 
though I guess he was dealing with his own issues after seeing her get hurt at under the mountain. Then in Aquafast, they hit him again, which is fun, I guess. I do think he'll probably play a role in the future books just because Reese was nice to him at the end. So yeah. Moving on to After Fear is Freed. I do think the novel slowed down for a while. Then we get to what is undoubtedly my all-time favorite scene in the entire series, and that is the meeting with the High Lords. It was a scene I was waiting forever since it was announced because we finally get to see Tiana and Reese together. We'll get an interaction with Harkin after they tricked him. And we finally get to meet all the other High Lords we've heard about but never met. And can you say it did not disappoint? It made me feel so happy and also so angry in the best way possible. And it was just perfection. Also, the rose. Well, I love how no fictional character ever knows what diplomacy is, but at the same time, I live for the rose, so it's fine. Well, not really. Since I fell in love with this scene and obsessively read it a dozen times, I've also obsessively overanalyzed it. Before I get to my discussion, I will say that this isn't a criticism of the book, but rather just me commenting on their status because I'm pretty sure this is how people in real life would act too, and it does show their characters, which is realistically flawed, but I would just like to talk about what went down and my thoughts on it. So, we get them introducing each other, blah blah blah, and then BAM, Tamlin arrives. First off, this was the scene that really set it in that Tamlin is an absolute asshole. He makes the slightly questionable decision to choose a political meeting as the best time to complain about how much his love life sucks, and he is actually is such a dick about it. One of the conversations they have is Ray saying, I'm not in the business of discussing plans without enemies. And Tamlin responds saying, no, you're just in the business of fucking them. Which, credit where credit is due, is a solid rose. Because why be concerned about why Reese did what he did when you can just focus on the rose? Blah blah blah, and he essentially says, If you haven't stolen my bride away in the night, reason, I would not have been forced to take such drastic measures to get her back. To which Fiora responds, The sun was rising when I left you. Which, I get is metaphorical, but that was such a weak comeback. Like, Tamlin is accusing Reese of stealing Fira away and leading to the start of the war. So, should Fira spend her time countering the fact that Reese stole her away? Or should she counter the time of the day when he stole her away? Obviously, the latter, am I right? Afterwards, we get his perspective on what happened and how he's trying to do what he could to help Fira. Which I enjoy despite his non existent ability to think logically and how he's obviously trusting it for his own political gain and paying Reese as the villain. I did enjoy seeing his perspective though. However, then he goes on and calls Fira his spoiled goods and talks about the sound she makes while having sex. Which, first of all, great diverting. What does this conversation have to do anything with what he did with Highburn? Second of all, can you stop talking? Tamlin keeps yapping on about how he did his best, which honestly is all his speech. And then Reese just responds with, well played Tamlin, you're learning. This is the kind of sentence that I feel like isn't the strongest counter because he's not addressing any of Tamlin's actual claims. But then again, that could just be because everyone already knows that Tamlin is lying. But I did absolutely adore how condescending those words were. Moving on, on the other hand, a perspective that I did appreciate was Clias and Yanni. Clias has this argument with Reese. He pretty much says, You stood by her throne when the order was given, referring to the murder of two winter young women. And Reese responds, saying, I tried to stop it. And he just yells back, Tell that to the parents of the two dozen young that she butchered, that you tried. And Reese whispers, There's not one day that I don't remember it. And Calais doesn't get sympathetic and says back, Remembering doesn't bring them back, now does it? And then Reese just reveals his character when he replies away, No, it doesn't. And now I'm doing everything in my power to keep it from happening again. My heart? However, I do feel like this scene goes back to what I said earlier about how Reese isn't a morally perfect character. When Clias and Yanni questioned the things Reese did and how he stood by Emmerman's side while she did all these horrible things, I feel they were almost portrayed as a villain. It's never explicitly stated, 
So I feel like it's kind of implied in how extreme their arguments were and Peter's sympathy to Reese and the whole thing about how Reese is such a self-sacrificing character for allowing others to hate on him just so he can protect the people he loves. But I feel like questioning the things he did under the mountain is not an absurd thing to do. Here's the thing. Sure, Reese did what he had to do to save his friends and family, but the other High Lords don't care about that. They care about the fact that he was serving and doing the dirty work of the woman, oh, I'm sorry, female, who was torturing and butchering innocent people, including their friends and family. Look, I wouldn't be so forgiving either. Sure, he didn't want to, but why would they care about his internal conflict and all that he's endured, like Pharaoh does? when they see the horrible things that he's tangibly done and his very questionable record. I'm not blaming Reese for doing what he had to do to protect Valerius and his people. In fact, given the reality that he couldn't stop Amaranth, that I think he did the right thing. But I'm also not blaming Clias and the other High Lords for hating him either. At the same time though, I did not understand the objective or end goal of any of the High Lords when they were throwing insults at him. Like, it's obvious that High Brun is the main threat and the common enemy, especially after the attack on that summer city whose name I don't know how to pronounce, raising an army, sending his nieces to scout the border, and, you know, this little thing called 50 years of Amaranth's tyrannical reign. Like, I don't think that even they are so stupid as to think that he's not the enemy. Maybe he, they don't know what the reader knows, but it's not that hard to figure out that he's chaos. Like, we served under Amarantha, and it's revealed that Highburn attacked on a city the Amarantha didn't know existed and therefore couldn't attack. A city that just so happens to be Reese's home and the Night Court. I don't know, maybe put two and two together and realize that maybe, just maybe, he did what he had to to protect his people. Which, by the way, was more than they ever did. And maybe, just maybe, this translates to the fact that he actually wants to protect Prithian. Look, they don't have to like him as a person. I get that. I agree with that. But these people are the rulers of Printhian, and they should probably be smart enough to recognize that the threat is Highburn. And like, after what happened, why would you dismiss this army of Illyrians, who are a pretty predominant friend for us in an actual battle? I can even get not caring enough for the humans to want to fight for them, but like, after Highburn kills the human, he'll turn around and try to conquer Printhian, so do they not want to offer any resistance? Also, there's a scene when Tamlin says, Will we fight Highburn just to find ourselves with the king and queen of Printhian? So, do you not want to fight Highburn? Because if you don't stop Highburn, he'll be the king and there won't be a Printhian for Reese to be king of. Tamlin may claim he's not a spy, but he's doing a great job of dividing and conquering them. I get that they're skeptical of Reese's loyalty after he served under Amarantha. But Reese also brought a very good argument that they're all in a room, and if he felt like it, he could just break into their minds, and they would be absolutely helpless to stop him. And I'm sorry, Burian, but scoffing is what you do when someone says something absurd. It isn't an effective counter-argument to a perfectly reasonable statement. Also, some of their stances made, like, no sense. Like, Burian takes his beef with Reese a step further, and essentially says, Reese is such a horrible person for what he did while working under Amarantha for 50 years, so, because I despise him so much, I'm going to work with Highburn to stop him. Keep in mind that Highburn is Amarantha's leader. Yeah, makes sense. Like, I could understand if they didn't want to fight with the humans because they're still struggling since Amarantha's rule, and genuinely believe that Highburn wouldn't invade them if they worked with him or whatever. But you cannot pair that up. We're talking about how Reese is such a horrible person for standing by and not doing something while under Amarantha because the reason he did that is because he didn't want his people to get hurt and you're just being a massive hypocrite. So yeah, moving on from the meeting, other scenes I liked include the scene where Reese was upset that Cassian disobeyed his order and that he put his life at risk and Cassian replies saying that Reese isn't the only one who could sacrifice himself, like my heart. Eris is a character who I think plays an interesting role in future book, hopefully. From Moore's perspective, he's definitely an asshole with how he abandoned her. But then there's a scene in the Court of Nightmares where he talks about how he didn't have more because he knew that she hated him and didn't want to be bound to her. Which, I mean, is kind of a shitty reason to leave someone to just die, but you know, it's fine. 
but he does show his lines when he chose to disobey his father when he was supposed to kill Lucian. Also, the Surya's death was so ridiculously sad. I also think that what the Surya said when they told Feyre to stay with the High Lord was pretty good foreshadowing because, you know, being a little more specific and telling her which High Lord would have been too much to ask for, but whatever. I'm not going to go with battle, but it was pretty epic seeing all the pieces come together. Finally, we have a Court of Frost and Starlight. Applecast doesn't have much of a plot, but honestly, I didn't even really care because the plot wasn't what made me like the rest of the series anyways. I mean, like, obviously there's a couple scenes here and there that I enjoyed, aka what I talked about earlier, but the main highlight for the series for me was their friendship in Banter anyways, and yeah, this was a fun book other than hanging out and joking around and talking about absolutely ridiculous things like pain. The most serious thing, I think, is Nesta's internal conflict, and I'm honestly not sure how I feel about her. On one hand, I get that she's been through a lot of mental health stuff after the war, and I get avoiding people so they don't feel bad for you because, honestly, that's me. On the other hand, the way she just totally took advantage of Fair's generosity without actually doing really annoyed me, and it was weird how, at the end of Back War, Cassian was all like, my one regret in life was that I couldn't spend more time with you or something like that. And now that they have more time, they don't even spend it with each other. Their relationship really reverted back to the beginning of when they first started hanging out, so I felt like the progress was undone. Though I do look forward to seeing how her mental health issues will be addressed in the rest of the series, and I'm interested in seeing what becomes of Nessian. So yeah, that will be all for this video. As always, you can leave your thoughts in the comment section below and leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it because I do plan on making more book reviews because I really enjoyed making this one.